All right, Chris. Yeah. Chris, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? I was born in Hazard, Kentucky, and I was raised in Leslie County, Kentucky, which is southeastern in the, the Appalachian Mountains, basically. And my my mother, she um, she graduated um, Leslie County High School, Valley Victorian, uh, got her scholarship and went to University of Kentucky and got a degree in nutrition and health and ended up on graduating on, in the dean's list, I think. And um, she's a very soft-spoken woman and very, like, she's bashful and shy, and I do have that in me. And my dad is the exact opposite. And he, uh, I remember him telling me a story of him being like 16 and his mother told him to go get a gallon of milk from a store and he goes, and someone pulls up, Carlos pulls up and asks, and my dad's name's Paul, he, they called him PF, asked him if he wanted to go and do some carpentry and make money. He said, yeah, so they go off to Ohio and my dad stays gone for a year and ends up saving some money up and buying a vehicle and coming back. And I'm like, did you bring her some milk back? And he's like, son, I was afraid not to. She's like, he's like, she she blistered my behind. So that's my dad, and he's very outspoken, and he has no filter, which embarrasses the crap out of me a lot of times. But yeah, my dad he ended up dying last year um, from black lung. I'm sorry. And he's a coal miner. Yeah, he was a coal miner. Done that for years. He'd been fighting his black lung for almost 20 years. And about three weeks before he died, he finally got it. So it's sort of, he done, he, he fought for that so that my mother could live on that because she gets it. And yeah. When you say gets it. She gets the benefits because they were married. Oh, I see. Like if she didn't have that, she wouldn't be able to live, you know, off of what, she would have been drawing, but she's good now. How would you describe your childhood? Oh man, um, my childhood was pretty good. I've got an older sister. My dad was married once before, uh, and she lives in Ohio with four daughters. I got a younger sister with three daughters and a son and a younger brother with a son. And I think our upbringing was pretty good. We was, um, we was brought up in church and I never had any abuse of that nature in church. Um, and, but like where, where things went bad with me was when my mom and dad would allow me to play with other children, uh, unsupervised pretty much. And, and that's where this pretty much takes a, like a dark space with me playing with other kids and, uh, specifically, there was an older child that w I used to play with, and or he was around, and um, he would have us watch pornography with him and things of that nature. And I don't know if this guy was doing that to sort of train me to do things or whatever, um, but that's sort of how it ended up being. And I remember the first porno that he had us watch. And it was a black dude, a white dude with a woman. And I remember it to this day. And I remember as I was six years old when this started happening. And this would continue for a couple, of, maybe two or three years after this. But um, I remember the feeling I had, like my body went numb and and I knew it was wrong. I knew it was wrong, but I was very fixated on that woman and, be, and just obs like became obsessed with her. And the only way I can describe the feeling is probably like winning the lottery and how also having someone put a gun to your head, you know? And, and that started a, a gateway in my mind uh, that, you know, it, it brought a, a six year old child to become the pervert that I became, you know, throughout my 20s and early 30s, man, I was bad. Um, 
uh, that that abuse did end up stopping. One of the things I regret, like I'm not going to mention names now, but one of the things I regret in my life is never saying anything. So I wish I would have said something to my mother and father. And yeah, six years six years old is, is uh, also young. Yes, it is, and it, that's you know you're that's where you start developing your mind and a lot of people you know a kid sees his father abuse his mother he'll he'll end up doing that because that's what he knows at that time and that's how you you can train a child to become something good or something bad and it it made a pervert out of me and that's something i regret highly how did that manifest itself i mean like when you say a pervert Pervert. I, I obsessed on pornography, became addicted to pornography. As a child, I would like go to Radio Shack and rip the tags off of the VHS boxes and trade them to another video and take that video home. And I had mom always get a blank tape and I would trade those and I'd have like a little softcore porno and that I'd give them back the blank tape. And, um, but it also manifested a person that would obsess on sex and 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 only sex and and just you know every time i would look like sitting in high school watching the girls go by them you know you know it's like i would do her did you see her butt blah 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 you know and I, you know i wasn't the only kid doing that but yeah that was like my mindset at that time and all through middle school and even this happened when I was six, six to like eight, nine years old. So even in grade school, it developed that that thought process of that's what a woman is, a sec, an object of sexual pleasure. And man, it, it took over my mind. Did, did drug, <laughs> drugs come into the picture too? Drugs did come into the picture in my early 20s. Um, my early 20s, I got hooked on some like lower sets, perk sets. My one of my friends, he got in a car wreck and broke his femur and got hooked on methadone. And that was something I played around with for a while. And um I'd say around 18, 19 years of age, I I became addicted to alcohol. And throughout my early twenties I was nothing but a drunk, partying every single weekend, drinking. Uh, I got a job in the mines when I was like 20, and all that money went to nothing but booze and parties. Wasted every. This this was where. This was in Leslie County, Kentucky, mm -hmm. where I grew up. A lot of coal coal mining there. Yes, um, I don't know. Like coal mining ain't. It's a unique job. It, with a lot of rednecks it's it's basically a bunch of rednecks making fun of each other for eight hours playing pranks things you would not want to even know happens underground i remember whenever i first went i had a girlfriend i dated for six years started in uh, high school and first like few weeks they held me down and sucked a hickey on my neck and that girl was very jealous and she was like ready to beat the crap out of me one day. And her dad's like, she's like, did they really do that? Cause her dad works in the mines. He's like, yeah, they do stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh that's one of the things that people's done. I've, I've put like the world's hottest hot sauce in some drinks of mine because people were stealing my drinks. I've heard people of, there's a guy I worked with he recently named Froggy. We called him Froggy. Someone kept stealing his sandwich and he ended up putting some froggy sauce, if you know what I mean, on that sandwich. That dude ate it. And one of the three people he thought it was was going up the shaft with him in the elevator and he and he taught him about it. One of the guys ended up throwing up on that <laughs> elevator. <laughs> so that's some of the stuff that goes on underground and you know but there's a lot of like brotherly sisterly love going on like it's a it's a trip it's been a wild ride and it's been a beautiful ride actually i like it yeah coal mining has kind of left this area 
Well, in 2014, in, in Leslie County, 2012 to 14, it started getting rough. And a guy that I worked with worked in Morgantown for Peabody and Consol and Federal too, and kept telling me about the union mines, because there's a big difference between the union mines and a non-union coal mine. A non-union coal mine is more like everybody is helping everybody. A union coal mine, you got, it's the union versus them. But you're going to get way better benefits, way better pay, and bosses can't make you do, th you know, they won't make you do things that you shouldn't do like they do in non-union. But I never had a problem with non-union. But when I came up here, I would have came up here straight out of high school and got a union job before I would have went to work down there because I would have, next year, if I would have got 20 years in, I would have had a pension, would have had health care. I could have quit and got money, you know, just like money each month through the pension. Like the health care is like 80-20 for you and your wife. So what West Virginia treats the coal miners better? Uh, yeah, in terms, of, in terms of benefits and retirement, that stuff. I've got a 401k I never knew I had. So when I got, when I resigned like a month ago, um, I checked that and I was like, wow. <laughs> so that, that was a plus. But I, you know, I never fooled with that type of stuff. But yeah. You, uh, you've, you've lived in West Virginia and, and Kentucky most of your life. Right? Yeah, I lived in Kentucky up until 2014. And then I moved up here to West Virginia in 2014. Um, uh, I was married at the time I moved up here, so being addicted to like pornography and sex, uh, I've had bad relationship problems, um, and they've always ended about the same. So looking back at everything, if your relationships keep ending usually the same way, it's usually your fault and you need to look in the mirror. And <laughs> wake up. Were there, were there other vices that you were involved in other than drugs and porn? Like, I mean, just sex. I've never been faithful. Yeah, but not gambling or anything like that? Well, gambling. Yeah. Um, uh, I Actually, around like 2013, I started playing poker and studying. And when we moved up here, uh, uh, online gambling was... I could do it up here, but not in Kentucky very good due to the laws and the nature of how the banks work and whatnot. And plus, cryptocurrency started coming out. But yeah, I wanted to become a professional poker player, dude. And I realized, like looking back, I was just an addict trying to fulfill a, a dopamine rush in my brain because that's like something I've done from childhood all the way up to like recent so it's so i became a lunatic when it came to gambling when it came to i i have a problem i can become obsessed with something that i'm that i enjoy but i won't remain persistent in it enough to excel so i learn so much and then i just want to i want to play get that get that rush man and I started playing online poker and I'd get to the point where I would like freak out. Like I would call when I shouldn't, fold when I shouldn't, or go out and like try to bluff when I shouldn't. And I would like beat the back of my head until knots would form. And I would like bite myself and pinch myself because I know better than to do these things, but I do them anyways. And my wife is sitting over here freaking out on me and crying and you know i was obsessed with money and like trying to be successful i learned about the law of attraction and all that good stuff and i was it was all burning my head you know um and it's uh, it was like one of the downfalls of why me and my wife ended up getting divorced she left me you know i, I cheated on her prior to that and with the ex-girlfriend from like high school that i dated for six years and I, being a pervert, I would record these things. And one day I recorded, or one day I decided to watch one before I went to work. Well, I forgot to delete it. Come home, 
or I go to work, the wife comes home and finds it. And I'm about an hour from leaving work. It's like almost 11 o'clock, man, and she, she comes to work. And I'm, I get a phone, they get a phone call. They said, Chris, you got to go outside. And the shift foreman comes up, he gets me. And I'm like, what's wrong? And I'm thinking, oh, it's my dad, it's my dad. And get outside, man, and she just, like, her face is just as red as her hair. And she's a beautiful, red-headed, freckled-faced chick, you right? And I'm like, what's wrong? And she couldn't really speak, and she just turns around and walks out, and I'm like, oh, man, I know what's wrong now. So I walk out after her, and it's like a beautiful night, and the snow is just falling down slowly. And she goes up to the back of her, her vehicle, man, and she turns around, and she said, who is she? And I tell her who she is, and she just starts wailing on my face. And I'm thinking, you deserve more than whatever she's going to do to you. You better not hurt her. And the only thing I could do was stand there with my hands behind my back and let her beat the crap out of me, man. And she busted my nose, my lip, and I still got a tooth chip from it, man. You let her do it. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I deserved every bit of it. Every bit of it. And that's one of the things that I've that, you know, I have to learn from that. I can't, I can't let, I, I can't treat the next woman I'm with the way I treated her. I have to learn from that, you know, and because one of my biggest regrets in life is how I'm, how bad that I must have made that woman feel. I, you know, my heart dropped whenever I, I knew I messed up and got caught, but it's a good thing I got caught. But I can't imagine how far her heart dropped whenever she seen that video. And man, you know, that's one of the biggest things that hurts me looking back in, on my life is how I treated that, that woman. And, and, you know, we ended up, you know, our divorce and everything went, we ended up parting somewhat on good terms. And, you know, sometimes, you know, message her and stuff about my life and, you know, but it's a it's it's a wild ride you made some mistakes oh yeah i've made a bunch of mistakes in terms of that um is it, is it just the the adrenaline rush that, that i don't know i think it's the dopamine rush hmm. um i actually i actually got into skydiving for about four months and that's one of the amazing most amazing experiences i've ever had but yeah, it's it's it is a huge rush. I'm addicted to anything that gives me that rush. Right now, I'm like one of my only joys in life is rock climbing. So rock climbing is something I love to do, and that scares me more than going up in an airplane and jumping out because you're dangling there, hundreds of feet above the the earth, and you know. Got to be great rock climbing here. We have New River Gorge is probably the best rock climbing on the East Coast, hmm. right here in the state of West Virginia, man. It's beautiful. You, you, so growing up in Kentucky and West Virginia, growing up in Appalachia, you saw a lot of friends that were involved in drugs? Well, if you want to go to Leslie County right now, about the only thing to do there is meth. <laughs> so, yeah, like all the people I graduated with, a lot of them ended up, ended up on drugs, ended up on, like back in the early 2000s, it was all about pills. Then they started, you know, going away from that. But like now, most people was on methadone, but now they've got suboxone clinics everywhere. And those people are just going to run into the suboxone clinic, getting their fix, you know. And, and now meth has hit, and meth is like, it's like a, it's a scary drug. It is a scary drug. And people here are smoking it? Yeah, most, mostly they're smoking it, and um, it's something if you do, you're going to stay up days upon days, man. And it's, uh, it's a lot of people end up like, it's a constrictant, just like cocaine is. My drug is cocaine, but meth is like, it, they're both constrictants, but so when you do them, a lot of the times men can't you know, get an erection. But being me being addicted to porn and sex, the only thing I can think about 
when I'm doing these drugs is porn or sex. And it's a lot of people, that's the only thing that they end up doing for days is like watching porn or trying to have sex. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, with, with meth, when you come off it, you start experiencing psychosis. And I had an experience. I didn't know that that existed. But the last time I did, it was Thanksgiving of last year, 2002. And I was doing it for like four days. And I came off of it. Got my sleep in. Drove back home to West Virginia. Got home. The electric was out. So I laid down and I start hearing people. And two weeks before that, I got robbed. So in my mind, they're trying to rob me again. And this is this feel this hearing these people, it sounds like they're really there. It doesn't sound like it's happening in your head. But I think what it is 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 the vibration of sounds is what make is is making it in your mind, is making you think it's actually saying something. But because I kept hearing something through like the vents or whatever in the ba in the garage. My house is above a garage. So I think that these people are trying to steal something from me. So I get my gun, and I'm sitting there for about 30 minutes, and I'm hearing two women and two men saying things, and I hear them outside my car. So I hit the panic button, and then I turn it off. And in my mind, I'm thinking some chick is like, oh, now, now he, we, we're going to kill him. We have to kill him. we got to kill this guy. So I call 911, man. I'm like, yo, I'm, I think I'm being, being robbed, right? So basically I'm – geeking out or whatever, experiencing psychosis, an after effect of coming off of meth. And three cops show up, sweep the area. It was like, we don't, we don't, we haven't found anything. We don't see nobody. I was like, okay, well, all right. I was like, I ain't staying here tonight. So I shut the door and for the next four to five nights, I go to Walmart parking lot and sleep in my car after work because I'm hearing that. Mind you, I work underground. And although I went high, I'm hearing psychosis and there's always ventilation in the mines. And I go, what I do or did was fireball. So I would examine seals and things. And I would be back there by myself, scared to death. Cause like, Usually you'll sit down for like five minutes or 15 minutes and rest a little bit and then get up and walk. Like, cause I'm duck walking all, all the time and crawling. I didn't stop. I did not stop when I went back in those places. Didn't stop the whole shift. Why, why, why do you think it is that so many people in this part of the country are into drugs? Oh, uh, well, in Leslie County, there's nothing to do. There's not, the only thing to do there is probably ride four wheelers. But it's, I mean, the, it's mo some of the most beautiful part of the It is. Country. It is beautiful. It is beautiful. When I grew up, we had entertainment. We had Fugit's Entertainment Center. I got a video on YouTube uh, go walking through the the old water park at Fugit's. They burned it down. They burnt the cinema down. I guess the guy that created all that, that a bowling alley, a cinema skating rink, water park. They had like two theaters there um, in Hazard. So in Leslie County, there's nothing. There's a couple of dollar stores. So people just get bored. I think people, it's like the, the, the experiment they had with the rat in the box. Keep the rat in the box by itself, have water and have water with cocaine in it. He's always going to that. You give him something to do, friends, fam, like friends and rat, you know, a girlfriend and whatnot. He's going to the water. He's, you know, skipping that. And, you know, a lot of people that rock climb that I, that I hang out with are former, my, one of my best friends, Rog, he's a former addict and uh, he's been clean for like six years now. Uh, when I was going through my thing with the cocaine, man, he was trying to help me and eventually I lost my job because of a drug test. And one of the best things that he he did was he said he said chris get clean get sober I mean you can hang out again and go rock climbing and a lot of people have friends that are more like they're not that way they'll be like oh it's all right you know but 
Uh, NF has a song and it's in one of the bars in his songs is surround yourself with people that challenge how you think, not those that nod their head and act like they agree. And I needed that from that person to say, we can't hang out until you get clean and sober. And I appreciate that for him, you know. Um, your, your life is turned for the better though. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I was very depressed. My, since my dad died, you know, and getting hooked on coke and everything, I've been depressed and lonely and very depressed at work. I've I switched portals and I've never been written up in my life. And here I am getting rid of, I got wrote up in like three times in three months, dude. And I was just like depressed. And once, and I knew that I would eventually get drug tested and, fire, you know, I resigned, but, you know, basically I would have got fired. Um, I knew that would happen, but, and I knew, I figured, you know, I figured my life's going to turn upside down and this and that, but things are going on right now that I, that I didn't know. I didn't know about like money put in a 401k that, uh, that I had. So now I have enough money to buy the house that I'm living in. And uh, my mom said she would help me out until I get a job. And my landlord, he's like a friend to me. Uh, he's helping me out with a job. So things aren't bad. Plus, I have friends in Kentucky. I got a friend in Kentucky that builds houses from the ground up. He said, man, come back here. You can work here. You know, help me out. And that I think that would help me a lot because I would be near family. So I may go back to Kentucky and, and work with him for a while, at least until I get my card back. I don't know. I don't know really if I really want to go back to coal mining or not. It, it's been good to me, but all the fun days are over. Like the fun times was back in the early 2000s. It got pretty serious around 2009 to 12 with MSHA and, and laws, rules, regulations and things of that nature. Yeah. You're lucky you have some good friends and, and family. Yeah, my family is the best, man. My nieces and nephew love me. And a few years ago, I was going through some things, and Emma J and Aaliyah and Jonathan Tyler, they're like, they're probably the reason I didn't take a gun and blow my brains out. And I appreciate them a lot. They're, they're the world to me. And Willow, it's another niece of mine. What's your biggest regret in, the, in all of this? Probably not not mentioning what happened to me as a kid to my family, um, and the way I treated my ex-wife. Really, um, that's probably the biggest regrets. Not not trying, not understanding addiction at an early age. I thought sex addiction was good. It's natural, but it's it it can it can hurt you, your family, and others, man. Mental, mentally, you know. And yeah, that's a it's it's a bad thing. It's just as bad as any other addiction, really. Yeah. What would you say the biggest lesson you've learned from all of this is? Forgiveness. Um, my well, in, indirectly, a few people have helped me with forgiveness. Um, first, I, I, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, so I'm not religious. That Bible will rip religion apart. Um, Paul Lucas has a video called Religion, Being Religious and Not Being Dispensational is Dangerous, and I recommend anybody to watch that. It helped me seven, like... Last July, I watched that, and it's, it's changed my life because it's broken the religion up that, you know, that I might have been following, and I take the book literal. Now, in terms of forgiveness and things, like Joe Rogan helped me indirectly by talking about sensory deprivation tanks. I started laying in those and meditating. Helped me a lot. My old therapist, Bob Edmondson, man, he... uh. I had a problem because when I would recall these memories, he's like, Chris, you can't have a 30-year-old brain in that six-year-old body. 
going through these things that way because you're not you you're you're six you're a child you got to you got to understand that and Evan Jarvis an, an old poker coach of mine man he uh he taught me about you know you got to learn how to forgive yourself and he and gave he uh showed me a exercise to do about it's a mental exercise and basically you close your eyes and the person you are now, go back to the person that you hate because trust me, if you've hated me, I've hated myself worse. And like mid twenties, early twenties, Chris, you know, I gotta go back. I today have to go back to him and learn to forgive him and hug him and say, I, you don't understand the things you're doing, you know, and forgive myself. And you know, forgiveness is that. And I want to say this to that specific person who had, who did this abuse to me. Uh, it was multiple. I forgive you. I love you. And before you die, I hope you're found in the body of Christ. Hope I see you all in heaven. That's what I'm, that's what I truly want. I, you know, and if I've hurt someone mentally in some way, you know, I want forgiveness too. I apologize. Mm. So forgiveness is probably the biggest thing. That's great. Learn to forgive. All right, Chris, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having me. I wish you all the luck in the world now that you're. You too. Out. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks.